I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar. My name is uh, Peter Wolforst. I'm a member of the NAGDEP Member Services uh, Committee. I work for Penn State Extension as a Community Development Extension Educator. And today's webinar is the first in the series of Wednesday webinars sponsored by the NAGDEP Member Services Committee. Today's webinar is Promotion and Preservation, Best Practices in Rural Destination Management. And it's being presented by Daniel Eads and Doug Arbogas from West Virginia University Extension Service. So at this point, I am gonna mute my mic and turn off my video and turn it over to Daniel. Great. Thanks, Peter, appreciate it. Uh, welcome everybody. We're excited to be the first, uh, first webinar here, extending the, the conference and uh, it's, it's reach, this is cool. So, um, yeah, Doug and I um, are going to be talking about some work that we did earlier earlier this year, um, looking at some some innovative, well, what we think is innovative things happening in uh, rural destination management here in West Virginia. So, before we get started, I want to say a big thank you to Charlie French um, up at New Hampshire. So, Charlie reached out to us. I guess when we were in Oregon at the National Extension Tourism Conference about doing something for a book that he's going to be editing on, on rural innovation and entrepreneurship. And Doug and I started talking. We heard some really cool things that were happening in Oregon and Colorado that we'll, we'll touch on in this presentation. Um, and we're thinking about how the work that we had done in, in Tucker County around destination management kind of intersected with that and, and what places here in, in West Virginia were doing that were um, Again, innovative, unique, interesting. Um, so we uh, we submitted something to Charlie and have kind of framed framed this work within that context of innovation. So um, I think that was a, a good way for us to to think about the work that we're already doing and and how how others in extension can learn from it. So Doug, do you want me to? I'll kick it over to you here. Sure. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Doug Arbogast, and I'm a Rural Tourism Specialist for WVU Extension Service. And uh, so, you know, I uh, obviously follow the, the trends and the data closely. And so some background on, on this study really came you know, several years ago. Daniel and I had seen these trends pre-COVID. The, the industry reports were really focused on this opportunity for destination management. Um, you can see here the state of the American traveler is typically focused on visitor trends and marketing opportunities and had a special feature on destination management. And also uh, the destination next study, you can see this big emphasis on destination stewardship. So that got us thinking about research opportunities um, along this line. Um, move to the next slide, Daniel. And uh, here, here's another report, a prominent international organization, Destinations International, that works with destination marketing organizations about really the need to kind of rewrite and reframe the way that we communicate the value of these local organizations as more of a shared community value and focused on that opportunity to provide opportunities for the community. And as you can see, changing it from a destination marketing organization to a destination organization. So, uh, taking that sole focus of marketing and maybe making it a broader approach to add value to the community as a whole. Uh, next slide. And, and yet another trend. So uh, looking, this is from uh, an organization called SCIFT, um, looking at the mega trends in 2020, and it's really focused on that new competitive advantage. So you can see here, it's, it's looking to reimagine the way that destination marketing and management intersect and how we're protecting the communities and that cultural capital. So that got us thinking about what is the role of extension and how are we working with these local organizations and their, what does their strategic planning process look like with these local tourism boards? So that was kind of the, the impetus for this, this research. And so here's a, a theoretical model as we dove into the academic literature this is from uh, an article written by Presenza Sheehan and Ritchie, which uh, created a framework for 
uh, the relationship between destination marketing and destination development. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a closer look at that article if you're looking for some um, good examples as how the two can intersect and what role these local organizations can play in, uh, in supporting both roles, not just marketing, but also development and marketing and management of the destination. And so that was pre-COVID. So uh, obviously COVID changed things. Um, and there was real, real concern about whether these destination organizations could even survive and whether their funding would be uh, stable and, and whether they would have the, the revenue um, from the taxes to, to even be around. But what we're seeing is in rural areas, people flocking to these areas. And so while budgets did dip initially, um, they they really started to stabilize. And activity-wise, we've seen an increasing number of people. And so I think it's made that management conversation more relevant in many of these rural um, and recreation-based destinations. Um, if you move to the next slide, Daniel. These are just a couple quotes coming from the Sierra from California um, in, in just this, this onslaught of visitation and the challenges that destination managers are having um, with issues of, of overuse, of crowding, of, of pollution and, and trash and just really realizing how they're, how they're going to deal with this and what management systems are in place to handle um, increased visitation. So, so for our analysis, our, our local organizations are convention and visitor bureaus. There are local partners in, in our destinations, and we have a, an association of convention and visitor bureaus. So many of these we've worked with over the years. Uh, there are close contacts in, in um, a lot of the work we do. So for this study, we reached out to some of them and, uh, and wanted to engage them in this conversation to see what, those, um, what role they play uh, really in marketing uh, and management. And you can see this is from the association website is that, uh, you know, from the association perspective, the focus is promotion and marketing of the destination. So does it go beyond that? And, and to what extent was really the purpose of this study? Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we, that, that we noticed as we were, um, again, doing, doing some other work and looking at, at how places were responding was that, you know, you've got, you've got places like Oregon and Colorado who are investing some resources at the state level to help these lo localities um, be able to better manage the, the asset base that they're working with. Um, that's not something that you, you see in West Virginia. And we, we started picking the brains of our colleagues um, and saying, you know, are there other places that are doing this and what's the scale look like? And, and really, th there's not a lot of evidence um, at the state level and certainly not at the local level and for these uh, very small destinations of, uh, of examples where they're embracing best practices and kind of changing the way they think about their relationships and their role in uh, the, the tourism ecosystem. Right? It's, it's pretty much all focused around marketing. So as, as we started to, started to explore this a little bit more, um, you know, Doug and I came to the realization that what we were seeing in West Virginia um, was, was different than what we were seeing in a lot of other places. Um, and and we, we do think that, that what they're doing is, is innovative. Now, as, as we go through some of this stuff, um, to you all are community development professionals, these may seem like no-brainer types, uh, types of things. But again, we're, we're just not seeing it um, in uh, the, the, this, this destination management framework, right? Like, so even, even in West Virginia, um, our, our very small counties, you may have a, a municipal level convention and, bureau, and visitor bureau that's focused on, on marketing and they're competing with uh, a county level CBB or a regional CBB. Um, so even within the marketing sphere, they're not necessarily working together. And that becomes even more true when we look at destination management. So things like innovation are described uh, and, and measured differently depending on, on what the researcher is looking at. But, but basically, this definition from Cantor 
is pretty widely accepted. I think the OECD uses something similar. Uh, so it's it's a combination of of new knowledge creation, but more importantly, it's it's implementation. So are you taking the knowledge and using it to develop new products, new processes, uh, new services, new structures that are adding value, right? Um, within tourism, the the research is pretty scant. I mean, there's there's a little bit of work that's been done um, that's industry specific around things like hotels um, and some firm level examples that are out there, uh, but not a lot. And research on rural tourism innovation, uh, there, there's even less of that. So what, what is out there, right? It, it looks at, at basically two different types of knowledge sources and how those are, are, are used to affect change in communities. So the first is this, uh, what's called explicit knowledge. Um, it's the, the research-based data reports, um, and, and those those pieces that are created that that uh, that are, that are codified, right? But if you look at how tourism tourism systems work, um, there's uh, more evidence that that this this knowledge sharing isn't done with these these codified data products, but more around these shared experiences and interactions. So this this tacit knowledge that's um, not not as easily quantified and, and shareable. And this uh, Hararu and Klein article is, is interesting. It looks at, at Norwegian uh, whale tours and how research um, in, in university systems is communicated to people who are doing tour uh, operations and how they're communicating that with visitors. And, and basically all the different stakeholders are communicating with, with one another. Uh, in this 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 environment, and it's creating this this co-learning that's taking place. So we can kind of think about these these destinations as cognitive systems, right? That um, have these networks that allow knowledge sharing to take place, just like you'd see in, in an industry cluster. Unfortunately, um, and this is especially true for rural destinations, but what you don't have are the the formal networks that that promote that that sharing of knowledge. Um, so there's some really cool literature that uh, Tom Lyons and some, some of his co-authors did that identified this role that extension can have in facilitating networks within uh, rural innovation systems. And we kind of took that and thought about how the work that we were doing and uh, other colleagues in extension are doing, um, how it, it kind of fits within that, that framework. So this is the, the area that we were working in. Uh, we, we looked at three Different, different places. Uh, here in the Mountain Highlands, we have Tucker County and Pocahontas County, and we'll, we'll explore those in a little bit more detail. And then up in the, the Northern Panhandle in Wheeling, um, larger place, but, but some cool things going on and definitely uh, best practices being, being implemented. So for our, our Mountain Highlands locations, uh, if you look at the, the map in the bottom right, the the route on there is Appalachian Highway Corridor H, and it opened up, oh, I don't know, I guess a, a year ago, I think it was pretty much completed. Um, and this, this dropped travel times from, from the DC Metro down to about two and a half hours. So we're seeing a whole lot more visitation in this area of the state. Um, it's it's extremely rural, but on our uh, our COVID nineteen map, it's it's one of our, our red counties where we're seeing a whole lot of cases. Um, I think part of that is because there's a this, this influx of visitors. So Tucker County is that that northern uh, northern dot in the mountains here. Um, it's one of our smallest counties. I think it's the second smallest county in the state. Uh, Traditionally, the economy was, was based on resource extraction, uh, timber and coal that dwindled in the 1950s and saw a pretty steady and large population declines. Um, now, the, the economy is much more dependent on leisure and hospitality. So you can see about a fifth of total employment in the county. That's even higher if we're looking just at private employment. It's closer to 30%. Um, but 790 jobs, $46 million in direct sales. A lot of really cool, uh, small 
art shops, um, breweries, outdoor recreation is really big. You can see the map there at the, the bottom left. All that green is public lands of some sorts, either wilderness areas, national forests, state state parks, state forests. Um, so so a, a large part of the, the county is dominated by this, this outdoor recreation activity. You go a little bit further south, Pocahontas County, slightly bigger um, and even more dependent on, on leisure and hospitality employment. So 25% of total employment in the sector, 1,300 jobs. Um, and another, uh, a lot of the assets are, are built on outdoor recreation. So uh, skiing and snowshoe, which is a, a large resort, mountain biking, but also these interesting cultural attractions. Uh, the Mountain Music Trail runs along US Route 219 through there. The railroad heritage with the uh, Durban Railroad. And then also uh, it's a this national radio uh, quiet zone. So there's a radio telescope observatory there. So uh, again, a very, very rural setting here. Now Wheeling is, is not so, so rural. Uh, but still not very large by, by, by most metropolitan definitions, right? So uh, the, the city of Wheeling's just under, under 30,000 people. Uh, the, the, if you look at the state's marketing resources, uh, what you would most likely see for Wheeling are things like the casino, uh, larger, larger events centered around that. Um, again, with this position next to Ohio and Pennsylvania really pushing uh, you know, attracting out-of-state visitors for, for these larger attractions. But, but downtown, uh, there's an emphasis on the cultural heritage. So they've got a, several theaters there. The, the one up here in the uh, top right is the Capitol Theater, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But this, uh, this property is home to the Wheeling Jamboree, which is the, the second oldest uh, country music radio program behind the, the Grand Old Opry. So some interesting history around that. All right, so as we thought about, you know, exploring this, this topic with the, the CBB directors, we, we looked at literature. Uh, this piece by Morrison does a really good job of kind of highlighting what we've seen in other places that are, are, are best practices and ways that, that DMOs can move from a marketing role to, a, to it's more of a holistic management role. So leadership and coordination, planning and research, product development, not getting rid of that marketing and promotion, that's still a big piece, but again, thinking, thinking broader. So how can we engage uh, local partners and external resources to do that um, more sustainably, and then also engage the community in it as well. So again, for the for the CDBs that we talked to, uh, marketing was still what they saw as their their primary role. But some of these quotes, I think, point to um, a recognition that they need to move. Again, not necessarily uh, we say moving beyond, but I don't know if beyond is, is exactly right. But again, thinking about it in a more holistic manner. So in order to be certified by the West Virginia Association of Convention and Visitors Bureaus, you have to devote forty percent of your budget to advertising. Um, and in somewhere like Tucker County, the CBB director told us that they're devoting less than 20% to any sort of management activity within the county, right? So this, this marketing piece is, is a, a huge component of it. But, but again, there's this, this recognition that without developing the product, right, you're not gonna be able to be sustainable in the long run and you don't have uh, that, that that asset really, that asset base to, to promote. Um, Frank O'Brien, who was in Wheeling, I think said it best when he talks about product development being small business development. So thinking about how to communicate the work that the CBB is doing to the broader community and, and how everyone can benefit. Um, he, he had another good quote that we don't have here, but we have in our paper where he, he was getting a lot of pushback from some of his activities from the county commission but again, when the commissioners came and saw the venue and not only saw the venue, but saw people in these, these outside establishments, um, you know, they, they, they recognized that the work that the CBB was doing was, uh, was bigger 
right, than just just marketing and advertising, but was really community economic development. So the way that they were doing it was primarily through partnerships and engagement. That's the, the leadership role that they were taking on. So Kara Rose in Pocahontas County um, said that her destination was three things, people, product, and partnerships. And that her job within that system was to bring those things together and, and make them work uh, in the best way possible. So Snowshoe is home to a, uh, the, the, the Snowshoe Highlands Ride Center. It's a IMBA designated ride center. And what, what I thought was most interesting about this, um, again, with not only the number and diversity of partners that were engaged, but if you look down at the, the bottom left here, you can see the destination best practices. Um, 26 out of 30 on, on IMBA's score sheet. And this is one of the things that they, they kept coming back to was, was that the, 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 the trails were, were good. Um, the, the, trail, the trail types and the quality were, they, they, they met the criteria, right? But what was most impressive was how these various entities were able to come together. So we've got Snowshoe, which is a private ski resort. We've got local municipalities. We've got local trail development groups, um, the Forest Service, the CVV, all coming together to promote, to promote this. Um, and in 2019, it was designated with bronze status. And just a year later, you can see um, about a week ago, they got designated uh, at the, the silver level. So it's a huge deal. Um, and again, this is, this is one of the, the newest ones on the East Coast. So uh, they're, they're expecting a whole lot of travel related to this. Within Wheeling, uh, same thing, right? So Frank talked about how, how they were part of other community development efforts that kind of laid the groundwork um, and, and built the network that they needed as they took on some, some rehabilitation efforts for the Capitol Theater. Um, it, was, it had some, something like 27 different uh, building code violations in the, the mid 2000s and, and was closed down, but they were able to to raise a lot of money, right, and and invest in the property themselves. And this, I mean, this this is unique, right? So they weren't just marketing this product or coordinating the the redevelopment of the of the property. They actually purchased the property, raised money to have it rehabilitated, um, and then were able to to use that to to promote the, the cultural heritage of, of all of downtown. So. Again, Frank talks about you know the, the stakeholders that were involved in that, um, and how because they were all at the same table, not just around this project, but around other community projects, they were able to move on this and uh, have it have it be an effective project for the not not just the community, but for the larger region. So a lot of the people. If you look at, at, at the, the Wheeling example, right, we've got, uh, so the Greater Wheeling Sports and Entertainment Group, that's the, uh, it's a city initiative. We've got the Wheeling Chamber of Commerce. Red is this regional economic development partnership. So again, kind of these, these larger players that you would expect, but um, in Pocahontas County and Wheeling especially, there was a lot of inreach that was going on. So uh, Frank talked about, you know, one of the first things they did when, they, they made this theater purchase was to, to talk to the community, to bring them into the building, to, to show them what it looked like, um, to remind them of, of what it meant in the past, and to talk about the impacts that it could have in the community going forward. And they got a whole lot of buy-in that way. Um, and were able to, to, to leverage that buy-in, again, to, to move on the project. In Pocahontas County, uh, they have a high school tourism club, which is the largest club in the, in the school. It's bigger than any of the sports bigger than band. Um, and it, it, again, it not only educates the students on opportunities in the industry, uh, but it's a way for the CVB to communicate to, to, to parents essentially, right? The value of the assets and the value of their work um, and, and what, what tourism means to the community. Okay, Tucker County, this, this was the one that kind of got us uh, 
kicked off with this. Um, in Tucker County, the, the external partner for the CDV was West Virginia University Extension and some other colleagues in graphic design, landscape architecture. Um, and this, I definitely think, meets our, our criteria for innovation. I mean, so the Tucker County was kind of interesting. In 2013, I think, Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the state legislature created the Tucker County Cultural District Authority, which was kind of this, this unfunded entity that was designed to protect the, the cultural and natural resources there in, in Tucker County. So if you look at our, our management framework, they're in the middle there. Um, and, and Doug spearheaded this, this process that, that brought together the Cultural District Authority, the CDB, and the, the County Planning Commission in order to really start to think about how their individual roles could be brought together under this, this larger umbrella. Um, here reporting to the County Commission, but again, just the, the relationships that were formed were really important. Um, but brought under this, this larger structure that would, again, allow for marketing to take place, but also again, think about the, the resources within the, the community in a more holistic way and think about that tourism system more holistically. So uh, zoning in West Virginia is kind of a dirty word. So even getting the, the planning commission on board and to think about, you know, what are the places that we want to protect? To get residents to think about what are the places that we want to protect? What are the important assets in the community that mean something to us that we want to preserve? Uh, what are the assets that we want to share? How can we, we bring all these moving pieces together? So I think this gets to, you know, what's the role for cooperative extension? Um, we, we've got a, a couple of roles. I mean, one, it's sharing these, these best practices in community development and encouraging leaders um, within that tourism system, right, to, to form those partnerships, to, to do that education, to, to bring more people to the table and think uh, with, with more of the systems type thinking. Um, but it's also, how do we, how can we help them share their, their experiences and what is working with others um, in the field, whether that field is statewide here in West Virginia or with you all or whatever it happens to look like. So again, Lyons, Miller, and Mann talk about uh, how do we create this scientific community, especially in rural places, and what role does extension have in that? So they highlight things like economic specialization beyond just agriculture. So again, we're, we're pushing that through tourism systems thinking and network building, bringing that university knowledge and technical expertise into the community, co-creating knowledge with these various stakeholders in the uh, tourism destination system and working across state boundaries. Let's see, I've got a chat popping up. Oh, computer, all right. Yeah, if there's questions, we can take them whenever. So these, these research, Driven approaches. Um, this was something that that came up in our our conversations. Um, Frank spoke to this. Jessica and Tucker County did. The quote we pulled was from from Pocahontas County. Um, and again, just how there's this lack of of research at the local level, um, which makes it difficult for them to, again, not only do do the marketing, but but also this management piece. So this is this is one way that that we think we can add value to what's happening. In these communities, we've done again the this quantifying the economic impacts of, of mountain biking in West Virginia. That this was a you know the, the numbers that we produced here were cited in the the EMBA application that Pocahontas County submitted in order to get designated as a ride center. Um, looking at, at travel and tourism related spending, looking at residents' attitudes and perceptions, visitors' perceptions. Again, how can we, you know, take this this data and help communities kind of triangulate and use that to to improve their product? And you know, we're not the only ones doing this. We work with Cynthia up in Minnesota, Andy, Michigan, um, Charlie and his team in New Hampshire, uh, Lisa Chase up in Vermont. All right, there's lots of universities that are that are doing this kind of work. But again, um, making sure that we're Sharing not with the not just with the community but also among each other. 
So another role that, that we've taken on, um, and again, full credit to Doug for, for this, this is um, his baby here, but creating this backbone organization, right? That allows knowledge sharing to take place, that allows resources to, to come in and be enhanced. So kind of building off what happened in, in Tucker County, this has been expanded to eight counties and, and 10 different gateway communities across the Monmouth and Forest. You can see that map there. And in the bottom left, some of the branding that was developed around this. Um, but this, is, this has been a really amazing initiative. So in the beginning, you know, Extension took the lead in working with the Forest Service to get this thing started. But that middle picture there is the Mon Forest Town Summit, where we had representatives from all 10 of those communities, about 50 or 60 people, I think, um, from the, just from the communities, not counting these other stakeholders all coming together and agreeing to work collaboratively to promote the larger region, uh, again, from, from a marketing standpoint, but also to, to creatively think about how they can link their assets together. And that's, it, it, it's been something that, that funders have liked. Um, it's been something that the, the Forest Service has liked. So you can see all the, the resources that were, were brought in. Um, and one that I think is really important is the, Second one from the bottom there, the Woodlands Development Group. Uh, it's a local CDFI. We had a $1.3 million grant from the Appalachian Regional Commission to do entrepreneurship support around the forest. And you can see the, the Mon Forest Business Initiative there, um, some of its successes. So again, it's, it's innovations that are happening within the larger destination, uh, but we're, we're, we're seeing impacts at the firm level as well, which I think is, is important and worth noting. And then again, this last one, this explicit knowledge. So it kind of goes back to that, that research piece, but um, how can we not only create that knowledge, but, but share it? So the National Extension Tourism Network is one of the big ways that, that this is happening. Uh, they've got conferences every other year. The next one there you can see November 7th to 10th in uh, Savannah, Georgia. But this is a, you know, again, an opportunity for us to, to take these, these experiences and what we're seeing and the, the work that we're doing and share it with our colleagues. Things like the USDA Rural Development Recreation Guide is pushing these, these best practices. Um, and then, you know, things like this presentation, uh, peer reviewed journal articles about the process are important. So um, that's, that's another way that Extension can, can kind of help move this thing along, right? So Doug, I'll let you talk about the destination sustainability and kind of what we're looking at going forward. Sure. Um, so I think coming back to this, this model that we referenced when we built our methodology and that sort of guided our interview questions and research. Um, and, and I think this, this research into these, this, this deeper dive into these three destinations helped us to realize that um, you know, beyond marketing and promotion, these local destination marketing organizations are really seen as leaders and, and helping to coordinate uh, activities within their destination. We found them to be active in building partnerships and teams and, and really focused on community relations within their community. I think the places that they seem to struggle, and I think as Daniel mentioned, that opportunity for extension are in the the realms of planning and research and product development. And so I think all areas that they, they seek assistance and they seek support, um, but, but struggle to be able to accomplish that on their own. But I think what we were able to identify is that there's an increasing recognition of the importance of all of these activities in creating a framework for destination management. So reaffirming the fact that management is relevant, that's increasingly important, and that these organizations uh, struggle to do it on their own in these very rural destinations. Looking at some examples, um, Sedona is a good one. Uh, you can find this online, the Sustainable Tourism Plan created in Sedona um, using the Global Sustainable Tourism Framework. Um, participatory process used to guide and create those strategies that will address resident quality of life, the local environment, all of those issues related to sustainable tourism. So 
I think we are seeing some destinations really embrace this concept of planning and management, um, but you know we need to see more. And I think there's a growing demand for this. Uh, Daniel also mentioned at the state level, so just highlighting two states that are, are active in this realm um, in providing programs. Um, Oregon there on the right was one of the, one of the most robust and has been around for a little while with their rural tourism studio, um, really focusing on those rural destinations. And then recently Colorado's come on board with their destination development program. So, um, and we don't have those type of resources at the state level available in West Virginia. Uh, so I think that's increasingly being called upon from extension and community development to provide that level of support um, if the state agencies aren't going to take an active role. So one example here, um, we did work with both Tucker County and Pocahontas County CVBs. Uh, they've engaged us in their strategic planning process and working with their board. Um, realizing that in, in addition to a marketing plan, they also need a strategic plan. So I think this is where we can step in. Um, with Daniel and I assisted in facilitating those, those meetings and those sessions and, and creating the strategic planning framework. So what you'll see uh, in these discussions and in the strategic plan is those activities that fall outside of marketing that the CVB board um, identifies as priorities and importance and is, you know, finding a way within that structure to both fund and support those activities. Um, you know, we found that many of them don't necessarily require funding, they just require some time. Um, but what are ways that they can assist, whether it's through mini grants or other types of product development support for those um, stakeholders in their destination that are trying to create value and create additional attractions or lodging or food service and those things that are desperately needed in order to grow tourism. Yeah, Doug, just to kind of echo that, I mean, that was something that we heard from, from all, all three of our, our interviewees, you know, is that a lot of places probably, especially the, the smaller places, right, think that they're going to have to expend a lot of resources, um, like monetary resources to do this. Um, but the what we heard over and over was that it's it, it's investing time, right? Not monetary resources as much. Um, and and so not, and again, I don't want to say that. I mean, what, what you see there, the the 2018 budget, right? How how what was spent on advertising has declined. That's a that's a good thing because again, it shows this this investment in the place. Um, but that again, it's the relationships and the partnerships that allow that money to really work and and to to add value to the to the location. Yeah, and for those, uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone on the phone is aware that the, the revenue comes from the bed tax, the hotel motel tax. Um, and there's this, there's this impression that that has to be spent on marketing, but I think there's starting to be a little more of an open view to that, that you know, product development is essential um, because you have to have the product in order to not to affect the marketing and to grow the destination. So starting to get some recognition that there is some more discretion as to how those funds can be used. And that with a strategic plan in place, you might be able to segment some of that towards more of management versus marketing activities. Um, and this is a program uh, that Frank O'Brien in Wheeling attended through Destinations International. Um, so, so we've looked at this, you know, the issue is that this is very expensive. So. Uh, really only the larger CVBs with a significant budget could afford to send their director to this program. But I think there are elements of this in how do we training or potentially certifying. Maybe this is something that extension could replicate for very small rural destinations that want to have this type of training and guidance on these management activities. And then not only training them, but also kind of stepping in and maybe being able to support those research activities support those uh, product development activities, whether it's doing a gap analysis of existing business, business retention and expansion programs, things like that, that can um, help them identify the products that are needed and then gathering the data that, that they need to make those informed decisions. I think those are, are targeted areas that, that we, we need to focus on here in West Virginia in support of these organizations. 
so um, one, one avenue that we have for that is through this accreditation process. Um, currently, the accreditation process is focused on uh, what type of marketing activities, um, whether the organization has a full-time executive director, it has nothing to do with management of the destination. And so Daniel and I are working with this organization to see if um, not necessarily requiring them to spend their funds on management, but potentially to start with attending some training sessions that we could coordinate that focus on what is management, um, why is it important, what are these aspects of management that they should be cognizant of, and the fact that uh, the destinations now are aware of this and, and if this isn't being conducted, we're not gonna be as competitive. The data is there to to stress the importance of that. Um, we're seeing this influx of visitors due to COVID in these rural areas and uh, attractive to recreational activities. And if we don't manage that and the destination gets compromised, we start seeing environmental and social impacts, um, we might be in trouble. And I think everyone's aware of that. So um, we're trying to play a more prominent role in guiding this state level organization. Um, it's tough, you know, because getting getting attention away from marketing, there's still this sense of all we all we need to be doing is promoting um, some of these larger attractions and that will bring people there. So we have to kind of change that philosophy. And I think studies like this can can help to do that. And also these these current trends and these prominent organizations stressing the importance of this. So, you know, with this data and with these trends, we're hoping to capitalize and um, find these, these CVBs that, that are receptive and also really focus on our role and how we can, we can add value. So I think that that's about all we had as far as the outcomes of the study. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add, Daniel? No, um, I guess I'll just go ahead and open it up for questions now. I, I saw in the chat, um, Gwen asked, does West Virginia have state byways? Anything to note on marketing moves? Uh, we, we do have state byways. Um, I'm not exactly sure what, as far as marketing those, um, you know, we do promote them at the state level through the state tourism office. And also they're, they're, you know, being promoted by these local convention and visitor bureaus. Um, I'm not, not sure exactly if there's more to the question than that. Um, Obviously, those are assets for, for the communities, and those are, uh, you know, attractive resources that uh, are being promoted. Um, I'm not sure I have more to add beyond that. Well, I, I do have a question. I know you mentioned the impact of COVID, and we're seeing that where I live. I'm up in the northeast part of Pennsylvania in the Poconos, and people flocking to get outside and enjoy the our, rec our assets. So I, my question is, has this impacted the pandemic on parts, you know, these tourist areas and recreation areas have kind of um, shifted these agencies to look at sustainability of the resource, you think, or they're starting to, mm. you know, protect it? Because, uh, you know, there's been impacts in many places of too many people at one site. Uh, I heard the instance, uh, somebody said here, we just had a planning conference in Pennsylvania. We had our DCNR secretary, one of our state agencies, and they manage the state forest, state game lands. And they mentioned that, or somebody mentioned that some people came, they bought all the things and they just left it there because they thought the place was going to, it was like, you know, disposal. They brought the grill, the, the chairs, and they didn't uh -huh. take it back with them. And they just left it there and trash and, you know, trail usage and all these things. Um, are getting really uh, compromised possibly with uh, with this increased virus. So I don't know if this is something that's going to shift with these agencies to manage these resources. Hmm. Well, Maybe I mean, we, would, we would hope so. Well, I don't know if you're seeing that in your conversations at this point, or is it too early to... Uh, well, there, there's awareness. I wouldn't say there's uh, an actual, you know, plan in place. But at this point, there's kind of... Uh, I think we're still in the kind of shock and, and all sort of moment of, uh, and like you said, is this going to sustain itself or is this just a, 
you know, a short term thing. And once COVID has gone, it's going to go back to normal. Are these people going to go other places again? Are these people that would be traveling other, other places and now they can't, so they're, they're coming here. I think there is some permanency though, to them realizing, you know, that these activities are close to home that they can, um, enjoy and that we better be cognizant of the need for some management strategies. But I don't, I don't know that resources are necessarily being dedicated to that yet. Yeah, I think, I mean, in, in places like Tucker County, I mean, I think it's interesting because uh, it might be easy to, for, for residents and folks to maybe ignore, and, and, and some of the local policymakers, I guess, to, to ignore the overuse of tourism resources. But, um, you know, you're seeing things like housing be a real issue. Um, you know, you've got homes that are being bought up for Airbnb type rentals um, and second homes. And I think um, pressures like that, there's, there's more traditional maybe community development type issues um, are a lot harder to ignore. So I think they're, um, it's making the issue a little bit more uh, important to a larger number of people. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, we're, we're just hopeful that there's some outcomes from that. Um, but so, I mean, we're focused on, on our role and hopefully the state will respond as well with, with uh, some structured resources that we can partner with. That's our hope. Well, somebody, Ann, in the comment section said, Visit North Carolina recently started a partnership with Leave No Trace in response to some of the issues that we've been talking about. So that's good. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is a question from Samantha wants to know if you have any recommendations for working with rural municipalities with a county that has a CVB where the municipality would like to take control of their own rural destination management, but have they have limited volunteer and funding capacity. Funding capacity. She said they've been working to form a destination stewardship council. They're beginning the business planning process. Yeah, so it sounds like something that we're dealing with, where you have a countywide CVB and then a municipality that wants to form their own CVB. Um, and so you're basically taking a small pot of money and making it smaller. Um, that that hasn't worked so well for us. But I, I understand um, uh, maybe this Destination Stewardship Council is focused more on the sustainability issues than the countywide CVB. Um, we, we've, I, we, we've only run into challenges when, when you have multiple destination management organizations within a, within a county. Um, the goal is that they would all work together, obviously, and be able to come to a common understanding on, on how to manage that. And like Daniel said, we're actually trying to get them to go beyond the county and work more on a regional scale. Um, so I don't know that I have any recommendations um, other than the fact that the, the Stewardship Council sounds great. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I completely understand the question as far as whether they should form their own organization or not. Um, multiple organizations within a county has been a real challenge for us. So, um, but if the if the countywide CVB is is only really playing that marketing role, then then maybe that does make sense. I mean, at the local level, what we're seeing the need for is planning and, and zoning. And in West Virginia, that's a really difficult thing for them to embrace is um, places like Tucker County have been talking about zoning and planning. You know, Mike Doherty has been involved in a lot of that and they're just resistant to it. But if they don't do something with all these people coming in, they're going to do whatever they want. The type of development patterns that they don't want to see can happen very quickly. Um, so it's, it's a real issue. You know, how do you get them to understand that there are mechanisms out there to control that, but they have to enact them. And maybe the stewardship council can, can help you to accomplish that. You know, we have this cultural district authority similar to the stewardship council, and we're, we're hoping that they'll embrace these concepts of sustainability, but they're going to have to enact some mechanisms, you know, to enforce that. And in West Virginia, they're very resistant to doing that. Yeah, that was going to be my recommendation is to think about some sort of framework where you, you allow the CDB to continue to focus on, on marketing, but maybe engage them as a partner and um, you know, running parallel with that, with the destination uh, management aspect of the, the 
Destination some stewardship council wants to take on. So maybe you could get them to allocate, again, a portion, uh, have, have the CDB allocate a portion of their funds towards that and maybe see if that could be used um, as, as seed money to get some small projects going or um, as match for grants and things like that. Yeah, that, that's a good point, Daniel. In Tucker County, they did have the Cultural District Authority was able to leverage some of that bed tax to provide many grants for um, product development and cultural types of activities. So that was one way they were partnered. So if there could be a partnership like that, I think it would make complete sense. Now, yeah, I mean, some of your communities, especially the, the, the ones in the eastern part of the county, you showed some count, you know, areas like Pocahontas, Tucker, and all those areas that the resources, a lot of times in a the, in the public ownership through public agencies, national forests, state parks, so forth. So, I mean, I presume they're managing those resources. Do they work with the local community in, in, those, in those counties to... Yeah. Discuss, discuss this issue of resource or yeah, resource that, management. That's a big part of what we try to do is just get them talking together. And that was the purpose of the Mon Forest Towns effort was to get everybody at the table. And so that we, we have been able to achieve that, you know, whether it leads to it is it's starting to lead to collaborative efforts and, uh, uh, you know, where some of these areas of the forest are just getting hammered with visitation. So there's a need a recognition of the need for the Forest Service and the state parks to have some kind of uh, management system in place, as well as the communities to have some planning and zoning and, and some way to, to keep it the way they want it to be or else they're gonna lose control. The question mm -hmm. is, are they gonna do it? So uh, we can't make them do it. You know, We can guide them and give them the recommendations and show them the studies and and the implications, but they have to be able to do it on their own. So we will see. Yeah, I mean, I kind of following on that. I mean, I think the, the Doug, you mentioned, you know, giving them the studies. I think, I think again, using that data as a way to engage folks. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you may look at it and say, well, you know, we're, we're not at a point where we're a, a visitor study or a you know resident attitude type survey would be. Um, needed, but but that can be a tool to to engage people around these issues. Um, so if you are if if, if volunteer, uh, you know, volunteer base is an issue, that might be one way to kind of rally people and get them thinking about what assets are in the community, um, and again, what's important to them, what they'd like to invest in. And I, I think if you know our National Extension Tourism Team NACDEP, if through these national partnerships, we can increasingly help to make these places realize that this is happening throughout the country and that there are ways to address this and if that they don't they're going to be left behind they need to be proactive before it's too late and that maybe as a collective voice it can be stronger and get these areas to realize that um, this isn't something to take lightly you know it's frustrating on our end if you you do this research you present the data you give them the information and you know they don't do anything about it but uh Sometimes that happens. Well, just, I, I, I just want to pipe in here. Uh, you know, sometimes the opposition is not the people, it's not the tourism group, it might not be the planning group, it's the elected officials whose mindset is stuck in the past. And you know, you might have a, I mean, I know the case of Tucker County, you've got a planning commission that's been working for two years on subdivision regulations. And every time something comes up and you have politicians calling them you know, overly onerous and believe me, I've seen them, they're not overly onerous. So it, 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 it's sometimes trying to get, figure out ways to get that information to those who eventually make decisions. Uh, the people on the ground, the people doing the tourism may be in favor of this, but the decision makers may be the big obstacle. Yep. Well, you know, again, I mean, I'm kind of probably biased because of the work that I do, but I think, um, you know, when you can show them some of those economic impact numbers, I think that that really helps. I mean, we heard that from Frank when, you know, not, maybe not the numbers, right, but being able to see the bodies going out and, and visiting the, the establishments downtown um, made a big impact. But again, you know, I think about the, the work that Doug and I did with the mountain biking. Um, that, that started out... Um, 
you know, j- just from it's kind of, I, I don't know, I don't want to say a casual relationship, but it almost was, you know, it was, we, we, we knew that these events were going on. Um, the event organizers were curious about what the impact was. We were curious about what the impact was. Um, it's not anything that anybody was paying us to do. Um, but, you know, we, we, we decided, you know, we'll look into it and see, see what this impact looks like. And we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that thing. I mean, it, again, it, Pocahontas County was able to use the numbers here at the university. You know, they're looking at how they can invest more in outdoor recreation. And we were able to give them numbers for that. Um, so I, I think, again, I think that data is really important. Yeah, yeah, I think that's helped us to realize that that's really uh, extreme value for these destinations. And our role should really be to focus on using the data to guide decisions and hopefully they'll act on it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Well, I don't see any more questions. If anybody who are still on would like to ask a question, now is your time. But if we don't see any, I'd like to thank uh, Daniel and Doug for today's webinar. Uh, thank appreciate you. Their, appreciate their time. And uh, I'm gonna stop the recording.